what I thought might be cool is things, talk about things that are going pretty well for us, uh, but also things that aren't too well for us. You know, in development, things go horribly wrong like 90% of the time, so we didn't want to just want to cover that kind of stuff up. We want to talk about it and hopefully help out any pipeline issues uh, with you guys. So if, is, if there's anyone developing, um, we primarily are developing for PC and PS4. If anyone's running into any issues along those lines and you think a studio like ours might be able to help you out, we're totally open to uh, talking about that stuff. So the first kind of new thing that's come on board for us is <coughs> motion capture. And we thought um, it's quite an expensive thing. We've kind of, if anyone knows who White Paper are, we kind of released this first person narrative exploration game to start off with. And now we want to push it a little bit a step further. So a step further for us is like the 3D characters. Like we did, we wanted to try and stay away from them for our first game because you know it's a massive technical uh, limitation to try and get over. But for this game, we're going to try and tackle them. So we're doing it in a small kind of uh, focus. We're only getting like nine characters in the game, but to save um, a lot of stress from our animator, we thought we'll try some low-tech um, uh, motion capture solutions. So. Uh, we're actually using a perception neuron technology. We, we were lucky enough to get out to Indicate last year or the year before that. Um, we met the guys, super awesome guys, pretty cost effective mocap for anyone that's interested. And we're getting some really interesting results. Um, if anyone's interested about those results, uh, where did Rob go? Rob's there. Uh, so if you chat to Rob, he'll be able to show you the process. We're kind of taking raw mocap data into Motion Builder, through to Man, and then into Unreal, and that pipeline's been pretty good. So, yeah, that's been an amazing help. In-house audio, so everyone should have an NJ at the studio. A lot of studios don't necessarily get audio, and either the designers start throwing in audio, or you get audio from somewhere else, and you start throwing this again. It's been incredible to have someone in-house um, be able to know the technology, know the engine, have conversations with us about technical implementations, and it just gets your game feeling and sounding so much better. So if you can, if you can get those kind of people in your team, um, audio will help massively boost your game. And I think that's helped us out uh, massively with um, our development moving forward. Animator, we got uh, Rob on the team, so um, Rob's the newest addition, and it was kind of double-edged sword because originally Rob wasn't on the team, and James was going to model all the characters and animate them and we thought we had the game well in scope and it's going to be straightforward and it's just all of a sudden it's just like <sighs> and so yeah getting an extra animator in was kind of our first call it was like yeah we definitely need someone to help with animation um, and that's been an absolute lifesaver it's kind of taken uh, a lot of workload off James um, but we didn't plan for having the extra animator so I think if we had planned for an extra animator the game probably would have been even bigger than what it was without an animator so yeah, we didn't. We planned without an animator, and then it turns out you always need an extra resource. So animation is a massive, massive help. And we also do arted block maps. So OJ is not here. If anyone knows OJ, he's the three D artist of White Paper. And we kind of went with an approach of doing a type of arted block map. So it means that the assets aren't really finalized, and it's just probably just a bunch of cubes in most instances. But we focus on lighting and setting the tone and just getting a broad pass of the game done. And it's amazing how much that can help uh, pace the gameplay and get an instant tone and kind of like, okay, this is what the game is. We can kind of get a very good feeling for that. And we were just across our studio um, with a few other developer friends of ours this afternoon, this evening. And so like talking about that and getting a feel for the game, it's much easier to kind of communicate your thoughts about design it, rather than it just being um, a block map with things missing everywhere. Like if, if you can do that kind of approach, uh, that's helped us out massively. Um, and pre-production, like this is a very interesting thing that we've only just come across and it's because for our first game, for all the people that developed either in the room, it's kind of just like, I guess we're just making a game now and we didn't really have any kind of pre-production area and it was just start building things as quickly as possible and to be honest with you, that kind of slows things down because you have a ship mid-development, it's like, oh, we, we can do this way better, we can do that way better. Not everyone can afford pre-production, and I know there's quite a few developers in here that like didn't have pre-production, we didn't have pre-production, but for this this game, we kind of, uh, we shipped on PS4 last May, 
So probably around like April till September-ish time, we were just like figuring out new tools. And the way we approached it is, I don't think I'll talk about this, no. Um, yeah, so um, the way we approached it is um, everyone in the team had something that they wanted to learn. So I was primarily like Kismet, based in Unreal 3, moved over to Blueprints. And so I'm, I wanted to learn AI for this game. James was doing a lot of technical art shaders. He wanted to learn how to sculpt and create characters. And I think if you have these drives in the team and skills that people want to learn, you should accommodate for that in your studio because it'll create a much more interesting project. Um, and it drives people for, to want to push those skills as far as they can, so that's helped massively. And then most projects, uh, this has helped, especially with getting uh, Martin on board with programming, like we're trying to build core systems, but off on the side, me and NJ, especially with the blueprints and the audio stuff, we can just be breaking stuff in separate projects, and I think we had a time where we were trying to put all these kind of prototypes into the main game project and it was just like breaking stuff and you're losing references and it doesn't go too great. And so having separate projects for the different people to try and experiment with stuff out, it makes sense to a lot of people, but sometimes you just don't end up doing that and so that's helped us a lot. So more importantly, the things that aren't going so well. Um, the scope of the game, like releasing your first game is like the hardest thing in the world and we completely blew ourselves out from Ether. Uh, on the PC version, we blew ourselves out, and then we had to do the whole process again, moving the game from UE3 to UE4 on PS4, and that was so time consuming and so draining. Um, we lost a lot of time from that, and we completely blew ourselves out. Um, and so, yeah, just be careful of that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff going around about a crunching industry, and I won't go too deep into it, but I think just pacing yourself out, making sure the scope of the game is is within reason, I think is an important thing. Uh, platform was tough. Like people, you always hear talks about moving over to console is hard, uh, especially for independent developers. Uh, that was brutal, uh, absolutely brutal. And it took a lot of energy getting it right. Thankfully, um, Epic were absolutely incredible because they knew what parts of the engine on PlayStation weren't, um, in Unreal weren't as strong as they could be, and they were just very fast to reply. They're aware of a lot of things, even though they may not be able to get the changes in place quickly enough to help your project. But if you're dropping a message on the forums, um, asking them for help, like they'll reply very, very quickly. And um, a specific person, Marcus from Epic, um, he absolutely saved our lives on Ether. So um, there's a lot of support out there. You just need to start posting and asking for it. Um, more documentation and improvements, yeah, come online. Time management, taking time to explore uh, new tools. Um, briefly mentioned that before, and pre-production um, gave ourselves six or so months. So this was also a negative thing, because we kind of stayed in pre-production mode, uh, and that was also a really, really hard thing to try and get your mindset out of. Um, you're kind of so busy, kind of in this kind of, yeah, I'll just try and experiment. You kind of have to have this switch to say, okay, we need to like start developing, we need to make a game. It's kind of sometimes hard to get out of that mindset. So that was a, a difficult thing for the studio to kind of get their head around. Um, and so Unreal specific stuff, as like anyone that's not using Unreal, Blueprint specific, really fast if, iteration for design focus team. Um, accessibility, uh, now that we have access to like the character controller and the HUD and all this cool stuff, like, and now I can just like break stuff in mind, can shout at me all day long. Um, just remember for the designers in the room, like ticks, even though they're this new awesome thing that suddenly we have access to, try not to use them too much in blueprints. And AI behavior trees are pretty heavy as well. So um, yeah, specifically, uh, AI and behavior trees, if you're doing, if any, anyone's doing an AI project in the room, something that I've learned a lot is to keep your tasks smaller, um, try and have your like multiple behavior trees doing lots of different things, uh, like multiple behavior trees for a specific task because it keeps it a lot lighter and, and moving a lot faster. And you're probably also best off prototyping everything in Blueprint and then moving as much over to C++ as you can because AI behavior trees can have a massive uh, way on performance and Oz can probably talk to you more about that if you're doing AI because he's doing a lot of AI stuff at the moment. Uh, animation blueprints, this is something that me and James were kind of struggling with. We, we're trying to get AI into our world, not necessarily that we're running gun everywhere. We want like exploration AI and emergent AI and it's kind of, how do we get this AI to walk over, pick this bottle up and we're kind of putting animations like in different places and it's kind of like 
glued together and it's just like, is this the way to do it? And then I always kind of put it in the way that Epic have designed the engine for animation blueprints to drive everything. So whenever the character's doing anything, just try and keep everything in the animation blueprint. You may have to send messages out there for different things, but if anyone's doing an animation-driven game, keep everything in blueprints because uh, the Unreal Engine is much happier if everything is that way. Uh, yeah, AI key tasks uh, and trees short and simple allows for more design. So that's a really interesting thing. It's like if you have all these different nodes um, doing these interesting things, it's like okay, I wonder what happens if I take this section and put it over there, and you get some really interesting results. So rather than just coding this entire system in one task and it's just like, there's my AI. It's like, if you put it in lots of different sections, it's just like, you can start getting some really cool and interesting results. Um, skill set, creating games within the team skill set. So um, we kind of, whenever we're starting a new game, it's like, okay, so what do we want to do? What's achievable? And we kind of drive the game's design by what everyone in the studio wants to do, rather than saying, this is an awesome game, this will sell lots of money, we're gonna sell 100,000 units. Uh, this is what game the industry wants. Just create the game for yourselves. There's an, a certain element of, okay, you need to make sure that um, it's a viable game option, and theme is very uh, important for a game design. Um, but we just started creating a game that we all wanted to create, and it's leading into interesting directions. Um, technical limitations wouldn't have been achievable for us. Uh, aim to the top of your limitations, but make sure it's achievable. So, you know, making sure you push yourselves as far as you can go, but that's still within uh, the kind of uh, possibilities of the team. Uh, and instead of thinking of things that you have to hire extra people for, it's just like, oh, we have this really cool idea. Now we're going to need to hire three people for it. Try and keep it within the team skill set. Um, and Unreal makes it super easy. Like any of the like the platform specific issues that we had on PlayStation wasn't necessarily to do with the Unreal Engine pipeline. Like we could keep the builds going pretty much in parallel, and so you can deploy to multiple platforms at once. So Unreal makes it super easy for that kind of stuff. Um, and open development using cutting edge features. So all the streams that they're doing, like the 411 stuff, um, there's some incredible stuff out there. Uh, hopefully it's going to be dropping. Um, before GDC at some point, and so there's lots of cool optimizations in there for people to use. Uh, what we'd like to see, more documentation on functions, so these are kind of things that we're hoping to put towards Epic, like Martin's come over from a different engine, he came over from Unity and he's trying to get to, uh, familiar with uh, a lot of the Unreal concepts and sometimes there's like just a lack of documentation in that area. Um, and also something that um, probably Unity is, <laughs> is uh, kind of pauses, is, that's what it does, it kind of pauses the engine before it completely shuts down and so you kind of know, I don't know this, but this is what Martin told me today. So like, yeah, I'll just believe Martin what I uh, More visual debugging, so the blueprint debugging is really cool, um, but there's nothing for like UMG or sound queue debugging, so I think Martin and NJ were referring to, like if they have parameters in sound queues, you can't necessarily see what's going on there, so be cool to have this kind of stuff, um, an ability to test them out so you can see the flow, uh, an ability to copy and paste transform. I was speaking to us about this before, and it's just like I have to copy location and copy rotation and copy scale, and yeah. I do that multiple times, and I can hear a few people agree with me. So that, <laughs> that yeah. would be an excellent thing. Uh, so Don't very very cool. So uh, quick shots. If I have time, I'm going to speed through these really quickly because we're already behind. So NJ's made um, some really cool. Um, do you want to chat about what's going on here, NJ? Yeah, uh, so basically, uh, where it says sound source there, I've just got a basic audio node, and they've just updated a feature in it where if you tick a box and just change a couple of parameters, you can get the sound of the audio, actually feels like it's in the room you've just left. And then when you walk back into the room, now, normally what I'd do is I'd use reverb volumes to try and achieve all of that and bring the fades down as you walk into each volume. I deleted every single volume in this area to show you that. That's one node, one tick box, with a couple of parameters. It's not perfect yet, um, but what it does is it basically says, is there anything obstructing um, me to the sound source? So it fires out a trace from the player and says there's a wall in the way, you dip the volume. There's no wall in the way. And so some, oh, we'll put the PowerPoint up as some good values. About 6,000 for the low pass, 0.5 for the volume, <laughs> and then 1.2. What did you do in that video? I wasn't even looking. Did you? No, you were shouting. Did you see <laughs> oh, Over his... Oh, yeah, he's using a bit more dramatic. And anyway... Um, okay, 
Okay, so moving on. And no one's talked to me about it, I'll just tell them. Yeah, so this is James. James, do you want to explain what's going on? Because I have not a clue here. I mean, I'm assuming a lot of people already know this, but like for people that haven't, I mean, anytime you need to use any form of gradient for whatever you need to, a really nice little trick, instead of like putting in a texture and having like an extra texture lookup, just grab a texture coordinate, uh, mask either the red or the green channel if you want a horizontal one or vertical one, and then you basically have a free gradient that's like independent from resolution. So like it's a really nice way of just you know not having to worry about extra lookups and like keeping your materials clean. Yeah, like, and, I mean I, you can just edit parameters to, to, <laughs> to make things. Cool. I like what you just said. Yeah. And then, Maya, <laughs> did you want to quickly say yeah, what's going so, on here? So, uh, as so I came from Unity, so for people who've been working in Unreal for like a long time, they're like, this is obvious stuff, but this is just things that I found really useful. So one of the things when I was working on our last game is I got really into designing tools and anything that would make the designer's job easier. And one of the things we were struggling with was stuff like we have uh, an object that you can pull out, <coughs> meaning you kind of need to know where the object can be when it's in its standard position when you place it in world, when it's forward, when it's back. And one of the things would just be to manually drag it around, and then you have to remember where it went back to, and there's a whole lot of faff with that. If, um, and you're, uh, bear in mind I'm doing this through C++, so hypothetically you could do the same thing with your construction script in Blueprint, but when you're doing it in C++, um, there are certain issues with that. So there's this really great function there called um, post edit change property, which is not the catchiest name ever, but it describes it fairly well. It's essentially a editor-only um, script that gets run any time you change any variable on an object. Um, and you can get information about what variable it was your change. So as you can see here, um, we've got this current debug state, and that's essentially you can cycle through the different states this object can be in. So is the object forward, is it in its normal position, and is it back? And when I do that, I just change the object's position to mock up where it would be in that location and change its material to some horribly obnoxious pink so you know that's not where it's meant to be, it's kind of in some debug state. And it's just a really, really quick way of being able to test things out and making sure that if there's something you need to happen every time you make a change, you can kind of code it so that you can't forget it. And it's a, it's a really, really cheap way to like lock values so that you're capping them, and there will be more advanced edit descriptive ways to do that, uh, but this is just a really, really quick way to do that. Um, one of the things you have to bear in mind is that when I did this for PS4, I had quite a bit of trouble until I realized that it's because it's purely driven through the editor. Uh, you have to have it inside pragmas for with editor, otherwise it will not deploy properly to PS4. Um, and probably Xbox One as well. I'm not completely certain about that. Um, yeah, the other thing that I kind of had an issue with, and this is just a really, really common, and people who use C++ will be like, well, yeah, obviously. Um, but I use Visual Assist X, which is kind of, because um, coming from C Sharp, I'm used to just writing a function and it's there. But with C++, you're having to write functions, then do them in the header, and it's not exactly the same thing, so you can't just copy paste it. And I got really, really bored and frustrated with that. And then I got Visual Assist X, which essentially lets me just generate stubs off my header. Um, but one of the things Visual Assist does not do is put in your super calls, which, um, when you're forgetting to do that, becomes a big, big problem when you're doing stuff on begin play or on construction or on, on uh, property was changed because suddenly the game just starts crashing and you have no idea why. And it's actually just because some information wasn't set up like 30 minutes ago that was, you were meant to do because you weren't calling your supers. Uh, so it's just one thing I'd watch out for. If you don't know about Visual Assist, I'd really recommend getting it. It's about £100, but it's probably well worth it for the amount of time it's going to save you. Um, like, just ridiculous time savers. And yeah, just remember to put in your supers. And as I was told me today, you can actually script it. So I'm going to go and do that. And it will do my supers for me anyway. Um, and I don't know if that was, did we do something that's about it, no. the blue utilities, or was that? No, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so blue utilities are a, a good one. but. Uh, edit preferences, my two little cents is using a small tool bar icons saves a lot of real estate on the screen. And also, I found this the other day, open asset editor tabs in a new window, untick that and everything just aligns to the top of your menu so you don't have a box everywhere. Cool. Um, <laughs> it saved my life. Um, and so, if you need anyone uh, from our teams, help or information on anything, uh, it's pretty much just first name, last name for anyone from White Paper Games, that's kind of what we do. Um, we probably don't have time for questions, but we're all hanging around anyway. Um, so we'll get going with uh, Andrew Benison's talk. Uh, again, if you want to go and grab some drinks or anything, you totally can do. This is going to be an excellent talk. So, uh, And then we'll also be putting these. <laughs>
there'll be an average talk, and then um, we'll p also pop these videos up online, so um, for anyone that was interested in what Mayan just said, because I had no idea what he was talking about, uh, you can go back and listen to all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot.